Okay, I'm going to give you, a, a, you know, this another simple, but is the hourglass image. And when you're in the hourglass on the bottom side, it's really important. I, I hope I communicate this one jewel to you. And that's you, we, each of us is in charge of how we see our world. We are so in charge of that and all the components of our world. And that we all start out down here in the perception that everything outside of ourselves has the power and we have nothing. The Buddhist definition of hell is that you are powerless and have no power to change anything in your life. All of us are going to be in hell, have been, will be again. It's very important to really understand this little part of our lecture together. This first floor can make or break you can make or break you. One of your great tools for navigating this first floor are the words in your head. The words in your head. Someone may put you in a jail for a crime you didn't commit, which is a classic definition of being powerless. You can't even get out of the room you're in. You're in five by six and you can't move. So that your only, def your only, your regulation of power is, is in the world behind your eye. But even then, Buddha would say, you are in charge of the world behind your eye, and in fact, that world is a universe. And that is the, that is the whole understanding of the mystical dialogue between Jesus and Pontius Pilate. When Pilate said, say something, I can let you go. And Pilate said, no, you can't. No, you can't. I contracted for this moment. You're working for me. Mind you, I'm ad-libbing. <laughs> but in a sense, and that's where Pilate said, get this man away from me and bring me some water to wash my hands. In your capacity, come up here, to realize who you are, what you are, and what is essential to your life. That whatever you're experiencing in the thisness of you is not going to bring you down. That it is what in Taoism is called the experience of saying, I will not attached to the spectacle. No matter the spectacle, the amount of strength we have to have is so gargantuan. And you don't accumulate that strength in your mind. Your mind is a weak instrument. And it must be scaffolded with the soul. The mind without the soul crumbles at the slightest provocation. It believes any illusion. And nothing can crumble the soul that's filled with grace. Nothing. Nothing. Everything can crumble the mind. Gaslighting. Did you see it or didn't you? You don't know what's real. So, now, when I, now, are you with me here? And if I said to you, how strong is your mind, what would you say? How much can you rely upon your mind? Do you trust your mind? Yes or no, to be absolutely, yes or no. Here's your next question. Do you trust yourself? How can you not trust your mind and trust yourself? 
How can you do both? Huh? Well, I may ask you something. How can you answer the question so fast without reflection? How come none of you is saying, whoa, 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 whoa. I've never asked myself that. I need to genuinely take that in and ask myself if I really trust myself. Let me, let me just think about this. You're going like this. No, yes, no, yes. You have no idea. And the faster you answer, the less you know. The faster you answer, the less you know. Do you trust yourself? You should have said, in what capacity? Huh, you're not, an, you're not even answering. You're not even getting the depth of that question. Do you break your word to yourself? Then you don't trust yourself at all. You have no trust in yourself at all. None whatsoever. Because you break your word to yourself. Would you trust someone who broke their word to you? Then you don't trust yourself. If you say to yourself, don't you dare do this again. Don't you dare lose your temper again. Don't you dare eat sugar again. Don't you dare. William James in some varieties of a religious experience wrote in the late 1800s, if you want to redirect your soul, you make a choice and you quote, suffer not one exception. We, don't, we talk about St. Benedict's guidance on how to make a decision, and you never look back. That's not the way most people treat themselves. They look back, they ruminate, they go back, they this, they that. No. The, capacity, the, the way in which you treat yourself is that I've made this decision, I don't look back, I don't allow myself to look back, it's not, that's it. I say to myself, this is a boundary. I don't talk about this now. That's it, the end of the sentence. Don't go there again. Don't talk to me about that again. It's over. Don't cross that boundary. To be this clear and clean. OK, the ability to manage hell comes from choices like that. The ability for you to say, I've got to get out of hell. I've got to make some damn good choices now. The ability to recognize this. I am in a cycle of change. This cycle requires that I make some choices. What are those choices that I need to make and I need to make them now? I need to make them now. I'm keeping myself in hell and I need to make them now. Hit a pause button. When I then pursued, not from why people are not healing, but I began to look at the next level of consciousness. Can we heal? What, why are people afraid of healing? What kind of power in us is healing? What kind of power do we have to actually change our life? What is inspiration about? What is guidance about? How come we are compelled to find happiness? What are we driven by, but we rarely get there? How come people are afraid to make the very choices they keep seeking, but they don't get there? How come they never get there? Why is it so difficult for people to make the choices they keep saying, but tell me how? Why can't they just do it? What is that so difficult about? Why do people struggle with forgiveness? Just bloody forgive. Why are the things that really make us feel good so hard to do, and the things that make people feel badly, or the desire to make someone else feel badly, so easy? Because that's the truth. Why is it easier for us to be negative? And therapy to be positive. We have to go through therapy to become positive people. Because it's so difficult and it's effortless to be negative. 
effortless. It is effortless to dwell in our sadness, effortless to dwell in our sorrow, effortless to share our self-pity. But we can't bear the light of somebody else. We have to get away from them if they're too happy. We wish them negativity if, they're too, if they have too much. If they're too talented, we curse them in our hearts with jealousy. We can't bear the abundance of light in another person. What is that about us? The turning to another and say, wow, what can I do to enhance your gifts is something we barely choke on when it comes out. Why is it so easy for us to be negative and so difficult to share our graces? Go ahead, talk to me. I've asked you a 30 questions. <laughs> Come on. Yeah? If, if you define the self as the soul... Where did that go? Wait a minute, David's in route. Mm -hmm. These are worthy questions, guys. Because this is that pivotal level. The reason I'm asking is this is that pivotal level at which your ego meets your soul. Your soul meets your ego. Your inner self, that little part of you, this is where you decide do I tell myself that I'm going to play by the rules of consciousness? Or do I tell myself, do I pretend to not be intuitive? Do I pretend to not have gut instincts that tell me, I've just gotten a signal that I shouldn't do this. I've just gotten a signal that I shouldn't do this. Do I pretend? to not know better that what I just said was not okay do I, or that it is okay? Do I pretend to not sense that homeless person? Do I pretend to not be as intuitive as I am? Do you see what I'm saying? This is this place where do I, do I pretend to, to not know that a lot of what I believe is not true. And it's time for me to start getting ready to get rid of the furniture on the third floor and move to the fourth. There comes the point where you have to, this is what that deeper reflection where you realize I, there comes a point where the big anguish in you the big test is I need to examine how the tools with which I have set up my world. And there comes a point where you realize I am nurturing and sustaining a lot of beliefs in myself that are simply not true. And I respond to them as if they were true. I become angry at others as if what they're saying is the truth. And it's not the truth. America's the best and the bravest. No, it's not. No, it's not. And I don't respond to that anymore. I might like it to be in my heart, but the truth is it's not. Stop it. I might want it to be, but it's not. Okay? It's not the most generous. It's turned out to be selfish. Okay? It, it, the, the world is a different place. I would love all things to be headed toward a simple conclusion that will work itself out, but the truth is it won't. We aren't heading toward a happy, happy land. We're heading to a trouble. We're a nuclear planet led by fools. And there isn't an off-planet God that's going to come down and say, now stop it, don't push that button. 
that button is going to get pushed. It is. And that's a fact. I wish it were otherwise, but it's not. We have to brace ourselves because we are living in the era of the unthinkable. We've been living up till now thinking, oh, it can't happen. Why, why can't it happen? Why do you think it can't happen? Because it's never happened. So what? If you don't change course, we're on the course we're on. We think it can't possibly happen. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Because you don't want it to happen, do you think that will ever stop something? Okay. What, ha what we're looking at, what you have to look at in yourself, is when we get to a place where I have to stop believing things that are probably not true and look at things through a little bit more accurate lens. Do I want to do that? And why is it so difficult? Go ahead. Well, that's a perfect timing for my question. So is, is it too simplistic or naive to think of the self as being the source or do you think the soul is that slippery or undeveloped that to, to call yourself your... I mean, you asked a question about do you trust yourself? I'm still with that. Oh. But, you know, do you trust yourself? And I, I would have said yes, but I see myself as within my soul or is that... I don't care what vocabulary you use. That's a word game. But your inner, that part of you that is able to perceive truth, truth, that part of you that is the deepest part of the metronome in you, that knows I have just violated myself or betrayed myself or I know this isn't not. the part of you that actually deals with what is truth and what is not, what is sin and what is not. That part of you is the closest thing to soul. What would you language that? What? What language would you use for that part of you, not soul? Language? Well, I, that to me is soul. Oh. That part that recognizes truth. Because that part will never let you off the hook. That's the part of you that if you violate your soul, it will harass you. It will bang against the door of your conscience. It will keep you up at night. It will torment you. And this is the part of us that when we violate ourselves, oftentimes in order to, <clears throat> in the past, when we have committed acts of psychic self-mutilation, when we've lied, when we have done things here in ourselves or to others, when we have knowingly violated the rules of, of the soul. For example, I'll throw something out at you. Here's a question, if I was your spiritual director, and we're going up the ladder here. I wouldn't ask you this so much on the first floor, but if I began to have you at myself and I saw you suffering inside, the difference between physical pain and what I began to notice is true inner suffering. Pain, suffering. Is when we make a decision and it's conscious and you make the decision knowing that it's going to hurt another person. And you know it. You know it. But it doesn't stop you. You do it anyway. And then what's worse is when it's time to explain yourself to the person, you tell them you didn't mean it. You tell them, I, you know, I never meant to hurt you. Geez, wow, how'd that happen? So you add a little bit of a twist of a lie there. Because it didn't matter to you that they were hurt. You wanted it, you did it. Now how many of you have ever done something like that? We all have, okay? Now that's the definition of a sin. That's actually the definition of a sin. The conscious act of harming another, conscious. 
or deciding that, <clears throat> you know, it gets a little, you know, the sins kind of grow in magnitude. But the soul in us won't leave us alone if we've committed a sin. The conscious act of harming another. And the operative word is it's conscious. We've tampered with the life of another person. And, it, and, 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 and someone in the Eastern tradition would say, that's karma, that's, where, that's why God created karma, and it's true. Okay, now, as we climb up this little ladder here, at some point, we become very conscious of that. Down here, we get to tell ourselves that what we could become conscious of is not, on the first floor, you are not paying attention to your inner motivation. Rather, you base your inner motivation on outside behavior. I get to do this because of what they did. So down here, it's all about vengeance that justifies your activity. I get to do this because of what they did. So it's all about making yourself feel better for what someone else did to you. But as you ascend in consciousness, and, and, and by the way, there's nothing about that, then get this, you better get this one, this better get burned into your brain. There's nothing about Hammurabi's code that will ever help your health. In fact, this is how you get sick. An eye for an eye will take you down. So while an eye for an eye justice might in the courtroom or might in one-on-one in, in, in -on -one make you feel temporarily that you've gotten one-upmanship on somebody, for the sake of your hubris, trust me when I tell you that you have not, you have lost far more than you've gained. Whereas, eventually, when we start understanding, wait a minute here, that all the spiritual masters, none of them, not one spiritual master, has ever taught that the way to balance power, the way to, the way to be in yourself is to strike out, but just enough to where you even the scale against the other. Rather, they all teach, spot the illusion and choose center. Spot the illusion and command your soul, not their soul, your soul. Spot the illusion. Spot it. Jesus' voice was, turn the other cheek. Buddha said, spot the illusion. The Tao says, even out. Even out, warrior, put the sword down. Spot it. Get that, get it, that you're on the playing field to watch what this, how easily you are called into battle. How simple you, what, fall on your own sword. Look how easily someone can call you into battle. Look how quickly I can activate your hubris. Look how fast you fall for a trick. You are like a marionette. There's nothing to you. This easy, one tone of voice and you're, you're fallen. One, one look of my eye and I have you like this. There's nothing to you. You're weak, you're spineless. Evil owns you. I have it this fast and you're thinking dark thoughts. This fast you're thinking like that. That's all it takes. And when you say to me, how come I'm in depression? How come, why do you think? Why? Because it's nothing to be commanded by something. Nothing. The slightest thing. Someone's disapproval. Not enough attention. And you're owned by the outside world. You're owned. That's how fast. That's how fast. Are you with me here? 
when I saw this, I was so, I thought there had to be, what is the next level of us that where we, where we go to where we figure out, you know, what else do we have to figure out about ourselves? We know so little. What can help? This is what got me into the next level, which was archetypes, by the way. I figured we have to, there has to be a level at which we can study ourselves and get impersonal about ourselves while being personal. Okay, where we can steal, S-T-E-E-L, steal our spine and our inner self to where we could understand our own journey impersonally so that our the choices that the, the way we live our life uh, is done with greater inner tools that I, I recognize like I, I have a um, the archetypes I have have certain patterns which make certain types of challenges inevitable. So, um, did I help you at all? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. Wait, mic. Thank you for running the mic. You're the mic runner. <laughs> I'm wondering if there's some way you can tie this into sacred contracts. These are events in your life that are inevitable and Sometimes it's your contract that you're manifesting, and sometimes it's someone else's contract that you're manifesting. In other words, you may be part of someone else's contract. Sure. Yeah. So this is crossing my mind as we we discuss. Sure. And it's a perfect yeah. time for that question because I'm about to go into the archetypal realm. Why do I hear music? Uh, it's two thirty. Sorry. It is two thirty. Did you? Was that important? That is a go pick your granddaughter up from school. Excuse me. Oh. <laughs> Do you need to go? No, it's from Ohio. Oh, 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 how cute. <laughs> but there it is. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. The question that I want for you to put on, on the side is, Am I willing to become impersonal about my own life journey? And if so, and if so, yes or no, just for the hell of it, what are three things that would change about your life? How would that change your life, to become impersonal about your life? What would, you, what would that change? Seeing your life impersonally. Now, it would change the way you approached problems. The word problem would change. How would it change the word my for you? What's yours if things are impersonal? Yeah, these are my clothes, obviously. Where's that wire coming from? My clothes. But I hear people say all the time, my cancer. What a dangerous thing to do. What a dangerous thing to do. Dangerous. The story of my cancer. Holy Christ, why would someone do that? Okay, but that is a disease below the waist, the ownership. And I know people for whom it is incomprehensible to become impersonal about illness. That somehow or other they feel that if they detach from it, become impersonal about it, 
this is my ex this is an experience an experience I've had just one more experience a life experience no different than buying a car in terms of being yet another experience that's how Buddha would put it maybe you're a little more rigorous of an experience but I'm detaching I'm detaching demanding rigorous more involved I didn't have to have a diet to buy a car to be sure more involved but this is not something but it's not my cancer I don't own cancer and I will not have it own me that's the difference when the moment you say mine you expect something from others you've invested in it and you want some response from others what is it what response are you looking for so if you say my in front of anything that is in fact an impersonal human experience you note right now what response you expect from others sympathy attention power put it down because you've turned it into a power object a system through which you want power and because you've done that because you've done that the object of that is going to make it difficult for you you will look for a replacement what how do I replace cancer power with something else is there a replacement the only healthy replacement is self-esteem that's the route I have to find esteem in myself so that I don't need this kind of power okay now the more I learned about this the more I thought our every single thing we do leads us always to the same question which is in order th that the only way we get rid of a lesser power is to find a way to empower that's it that's the only there is no other way we have to empower and that requires we release the lesser power that's that's the only way we go up and with every release of the lesser power we have to throw out some furniture it's expensive and people are sitting on that furniture when we throw it out the window there's no such thing as empty furniture so it's going to change things but it's, it's always furniture is impersonal people are personal so it's simultaneous let me give you an example when you decide to do something for your health how many of you have made a decision somewhere along the line this would be good for my health like I think I'm gonna change eat differently I'm going to I don't know maybe I'm going to do yoga maybe I'm going to do exercise I'm going blah 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 you get the picture anybody okay probably all in making that decision how many of you how uh, how do I say this did your decision in any way affect the life of another person that's my point that's my point they thought it did how many when you had that consequence of your decision having an impact on the life of the other did the other that I'm talking to you about feel that it was an imposition or negative or how many were faced with a negative feedback okay and the negative was because when you bring something that looks empowering into your life 
the other person is going to take whatever it is you're doing as a criticism. Even if the word operative thing, even if the word criticism is not there, it doesn't matter. It's going to look, smell, walk, and talk like a critical duck. If it looks like a duck, right? Because what you're saying is, as you move up, is I want a different view of life. I want to experience it differently. And when you are attached to a network that still want to live on this floor, it's going to cause a schism. And you, you have treated others the same way who've gone on ahead of you. You have not been kind, you've been critical, maybe curious, but definitely cold. You've given a number of people a cold shoulder who have gone on ahead of you. Agreed? So let us, this is archetypal. It's like, you're getting to the light ahead of me, huh? Yeah? What if you have a positive impact with the change that's happening in your life? Yeah. What if you have a positive impact? It's called inspiration. What if you've been ins inspired? Well, that's absolutely. Like the others, your, your person, is like, oh, wow, I want to do this with you, or I want to do this as well, because. Yeah, I think that's wonderful, and that could happen too. But, you, but when it's positive impact time, you're usually dealing with people who are packed and ready to go. And you usually have all been with them a, a while, and you've had the same conversations, and they've all been waiting to make the move. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you've all been dancing together. See what I mean? So it's kind of like taking a dance class together, and when someone says, how about if we try this dance, you're all ready in shape. So no one's going to say, not fair, not fair. Because you're already in shape as a team. See the difference? Yeah. Can I go back in past lives? Past lives. Why don't you worry about this life? <laughs> what do you, what do you, why do people care about past lives? Uh, the question I ask is because it has something to do with the project that I'm on. And What's so your that, project? Uh, it's uh, about my brother who had schizophrenia. Uh -huh. and, but I never believed it. I uh -huh. saw into his soul. And um, I do believe that we have a soul contract with each other prior to this life. So that's why I'm asking. That. You know, here's, I'm going to say this. Here's my issue. As, as I said, as we go up this building in ourselves, what, what one of the factors of the human experience that disintegrates is our relationship with time. And you don't realize it's disintegrating until, I don't even want to say until, you don't realize it's disintegrating. What, you, what gradually dawns on you, or perhaps dawns on you in a flash, is that you are grasping, you're grasping perception in a hologram instead of lining things up in a line so that you can comprehend it one thing after another. In which case, when you line things up one thing after another, it is, here's a word, logical, to then say, when did this happen? I need a when, because if I put things in a line, then something happened first, and then second, and then third. Because when I put things in a line, I've created a sense of physical time. And the when, is, is becomes very significant as your perception 
begins to, as sight, physical sight, I have to see when and where. Where was he? Was he in France? Was he in Burma? Where, 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 where? And I have to know the year. This is physical time. To know when, this, that, that. But eventually, that detail doesn't matter. And you shift from the when and where to experiential. It doesn't matter when and where. You shift to the soul journey instead of the body journey. And pretty soon, you're perceiving all things simultaneously. And that's when you realize, wait a minute, I think it's all happening at once. And it's a matter of intensity, simultaneity, and all things happening at once, at once. This is an extraordinarily gargantuan shift of how we comprehend or have the narrative we tell ourselves about the way it is on the first floor. Because on the first floor, we really need to know, believe in this thing called the watch and time and how much we're worth an hour and the passage of day by day by day. So where was I in the 18th century and in the 19th? It is incomprehensible to our physical time-based brain that will one day be dust. That for another part of ourselves, all things happen simultaneously. And it can perceive that. It can sense it. That the blending of knowledge, that there are times when I have perceived a suffering in someone that is coming from a lesson, a, 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 what we will call a physical life that has yet to incarnate. They have not yet actually experienced this. It will, but they haven't. They've not yet been born to this life. The details are merging and working and it's some are in this. They're working something through so that that won't be, it's something will be experienced in that life. It has nothing to do with that one. But we find that in, in, because we can't comprehend, and this is where I'm going, because we can't, we have such an un, imbalanced view, we'll never have accuracy. So it doesn't matter when we ask, what's the past life? What difference does it make? Because you can't comprehend the whole system, you are not allowed access to part of it. Right. I, I understand that because through a miracle, I, I found him after 20 years, so I believe... You found him? Where is he? We, we found each other. Alive? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And, and he was homeless also, too. Oh. And where, where, is, where is he? He died 2012 of colon cancer. Oh. But I do believe that he came back here, that we are soul contracts were meant to be. I think it probably started at that point when we found each other. But <clears throat> I get a little choked up about sure, it. Sure, of course. I, how do I explain this? Um, I just felt, I, when I saw him, I saw his soul. I, I knew that he was more than what the disease or whatever. I don't think it's a disease. I, I've always felt that they were multi-dimensional people. And it took me quite a Multi-dimensional people. We were. I'm sorry? We are, you mean. Yeah. 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 Um, mm -hmm. And that through the medication, it, it put a veil on him. Mm -hmm. And, um, oh, it's just... Yep. 
You understand okay. what I'm saying? Sure, of course I do. Yeah. And um, I, like I say, I, I saw him. Um, I, I didn't see the disease, or if you want to call it a disease. Um, but uh, I just want to bring more awareness to that. Okay. These people are special. Okay. 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 Now, thank you. Um, so, questions on archetypes, questions on contracts, questions on um, past lives, all these big, these questions arise from the upper level of our inner house, of our inner building. These are not questions you would ask on the first floor. These are the questions that have inner power to change things. If you ask a question, do I have a past life connection with somebody? Do I have a contract with someone? This isn't a question you, in order to get an, a clear understanding, you have to have an impersonal agenda. You have to be impersonal. This is in the first, down here, and your lower level, everything about you is personal. Everything about your agenda is self-serving. Everything you do is for personal gain. Because that's what the lower level is about. Every single thing is personal. Every single thing. And every single thing about the lower level is destined to, in some way, shape, or form, disappoint us, fail us, be limited in its capacity to make us happy. Something, until, uh, something about the lower will ultimately send us seeking the higher, the impersonal. Something will. And in my case, I thought, people can't heal on the personal level. It's not possible. So long as you're seeking something personal, you will never heal. It's when you seek the path of your impersonal that different doors open. And for me, that began when I, when I looked at, the, is there, how do we set up our lives? Is there a beginning point? Do we have contracts? Do we? Do, what, what organizes our life? Do, I mean, do we, we're not apples that just fall from cosmic trees. There must be a set of time, there must be, you know, if, if, if the scripture says there's a season for all things, there's a time, there's a time, there's a purpose, there's, there's order to our lives, to even the trees, to all things, including us, a time to be born and a time to die. There is a timing to our lives that is very, and, and, and then, you know, and when I was, um, one of the reports that really impressed me with people who had near-death experiences, because I spent a lot of time with, with people, was how many of them said that the non-physical world was very clear to point out you're going back into that body because it's not your time. You, it's not the moment. It's not the exact moment. And I had a couple of people who told me stories of their spiritual masters in India and uh, one in Tibet who gathered their um, disciples together to say, I will be leaving the world, and said, you know, tomorrow, next week, whenever. But they pinpointed the exact moment on the exact day to release their spirit, saying this is the, this is the time when the world would be least disrupted by my spirit leaving it. Such profound light they carried that they wanted to slip out and do the least 
it was like a vibrational tsunami that they would set into motion, knowing when they withdrew their great light from this dark field. So the, the timing was, and knowing that I thought, we must have some, are we assigned? Because to hear people talk, to hear one of the narratives we tell ourselves is, well, that's not meant to be. Well, what's meant to be? And at the same time, we have what we think of as choice. And at the same time, we think, well, there's, we're directed and in God's will. And these are, conf oftentimes, we have conflicting narratives. Conflicting narratives. Because as a medical intuitive now, I'm dealing in another world that says, I create this reality. I create my health. And therefore, I have some influence over my healing. But if you believe this, how can you have this? You can't have everything. This is turning into a spaghetti shop. You know, it was turning into nothing but a big spaghetti shop of what's ever convenient. You know, my attitudes have influence, but maybe this, but maybe that, and now this, and maybe it's a past life or a future life or maybe no life or this. It was nothing but a spaghetti shop of whatever was convenient for people to believe. And, and uh, the more I got into it, the more I realized most people don't even believe anything as a matter of fact. The truth is, the majority of people I meet have more faith in what they don't believe than faith in what they do. They can tell me unequivocally exactly what they don't believe, and usually with a chip on their shoulder. I don't believe this, I mean, especially if it's a Catholic thing, and priests, and blah, 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 blah. But very little. What they actually believe down to their soul with pure conviction. So much so that they say, this is my devotion. This is how I live my life. And I don't look back. This is my practice. I, I, whether or not my life changed doesn't matter. This is what I believe to be true, and that's how I live my life. That's it. I have come to believe, and I know this is it, and that's it. I don't have to seek anything anymore. I'm done seeking. This is where I am. I rarely meet someone like that. I still meet all these people on the road searching, and I think if I was still searching at your age, I'd throw myself off a bridge. <laughs> How can you still be searching? But, okay. So now I'm looking at contracts. And I get to the realm of archetypes. And how I got there was doing a reading. Norm calls me up. And I do a reading. <clears throat> and of course, the way he had patients in his office, he'd call me up, he gives me the name of the patient, and always with the permission, by the way. And I would get age, but not birthday, because I'm not an astrologer. So he gives me the name and birth date of this person. And instantly, I see a baby sitting in this chair, like a little w child. And I said, whoa, what have you got there? <laughs> and when I say I see, it's not like I'm looking, you know, at Debbie or right, the physically. Intuitive sight is, uh, have you ever been possessed by a fear? where you've been so frightened, so frightened, that you, it's just taken hold of you and you almost don't make sense to yourself. Where you've been so upset or so frightened that that's the only thing on your mind and it's all you can, in, in your, you have no clarity in your mind but what that fear is saying to you. Have you ever been there? That's what it's like except it's not a fear. But an intuitive download is so all-consuming that there's nothing else in my mind. And so for that few seconds, it's so clear that there's nothing else that can come in my mind 
nothing else that has access to it. And that's all I can talk about for that little couple of seconds. There's nothing else. And so the only thing I can compare it to is if you're that frightened or you're that possessed, you know exactly what it's like to have nothing else in your head but that one thing. So anyway, um, so I did this reading and I said, this person is like a child. I mean, and all I could describe was a child. So for the first time, I saw a pattern. And after that, that's all I wanted to see. And when I saw patterns in us, that was my key to the next floor up, which was our impersonal nature. And that we have patterns, and our patterns are stronger than our personality. These are like marionettes. And I want you all to stand up and go, oh, am I tired, but I will. I've been lecturing at you for hours, and normally you don't get lectured at too for hours, sitting down in seats and having to go through this. So I just want you to get, like, stand up and go like this, and, and it's getting warmer, so you get to do that. You get to do that. It's very, how many of you are going to go for a walk at 3.30 or 4 o'clock? How many, what are you guys going to do when I let you out of here, which I won't for, a, you got, you're not yet, but how many, what are you going to do? You're going to, who's going to stretch? Who has a massage? Who has spa treatments? Who's going to go take a nap? What are the rest of you going to do? Tennis? Tennis swim? What are you doing? Work. work. How many are you going to go to your room and work? Okay, good. Okay. Okay, sit down. Okay. How many of you are just going to hang out here? That's good too. Okay. Um, so, when I saw archetypal patterns, I realized that our impersonal patterns have are like our, our uh, center power system. And that knowing our archetypes and contracts, who assigned our contracts, how did we get them? Where, where did, this is the, this here is our entry into our impersonal self. Our impersonal self. Not our personal, but our impersonal self. I look at myself and I, th I remember my dad always saying to me when I was in high school then going to college, he said, I don't care what you do so long as you come out of college a teacher or a nurse. <laughs> but my dad said that because that's what most women were at my, when, when I was growing up and certainly when he was growing up. His sisters and you know, my aunt, that was the profession of women in the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s. You know, they would become teachers or nurses and he thought, I want to make sure you can take care of yourself. And I thought, I will never, so long as I live in my whole life, ever be a teacher. <laughs> because all, all my aunts taught grade school. And I can't be around kids. I cannot be around children. They, they, I don't understand them. They don't understand me. They're sticky. I can't do it. They're sticky. They're messy. It's like, ooh. You know, I have to be, you know, my five-year-old, my niece, Rachel, who, uh, for those of you who know me, you know, she's like my daughter. But when she walked into my house as a five, when she was five and she came over to my, I had just moved into this ta uh, townhouse and it was all fixed up, artwork, everything like that. She comes five years old and she walks around, she looks and she says, this isn't for children, is it? <laughs> <laughs> and I picked her up and I said, woo, woo. <laughs> How about that? To this day, I just think, oh, you're so me. Um, contracts. Everything about our archetypal patterns blew me out of the water. Everything. And it reshaped my understanding of God. It reshaped our, co the, our place in the cosmos for me. It reshaped everything. It chipped away 
began to chip away at the childlike narrative that we carry about what is God, how I need to see God. Does God need to look like a man, a daddy figure? Goddess, does God, is, does God need to be a woman because I'm a feminist and I'm angry at men, which is usually the case? What is this off-planet being? And when I say to you, the capacity to make the transition beyond an anthropomorphic religious God to, I think this universe is a system of conscious laws, benevolent light conscious laws, in an incomprehensible system that doesn't fit in my head. I don't know what that side looks like, but I think every inch of it's conscious, every inch of it's light-filled, every inch of it is something that I can't comprehend. I'm going to stop asking stupid questions, but the one thing I do know is that it's a system of laws, law and order, and that my body is, is an ecosystem, a biological, mystical, echo theology, an ecology theology biology. And that's how it's run. And then if I want to hold on to a religion, here's the thing that really hit me. One of the core rules, and we're going to examine this in depth tomorrow, is all is one. All is one. What is in one is in the whole. This is your core biotheology. All is one in your whole system. That core teaching is not supported by any religion. Religions teach that they are superior to every other religion. So come here. The core teachings of religions stay away from everything else. All is not one. Is in direct violation of high mystical truth, which is all is one. All is one. You are part of the whole. All is one. You must participate. What you do to one, you do to yourself. If there is a part of you that it, whatever choice you make affects the whole, love ye one another, you cannot, uh, you must not violate these holy cosmic teachings. You are one of what is in one is in the whole. What you do to the least, you do to all. Buddha, it's an illusion that you think. This whole world is an illusion. Everything you maintain here is an illusion. It is separating you in your time machine, which your body is as a time machine, from this energy field. Your body is just a time machine in which you're aging. Think of your soul as caught in this time machine and you're looking out of these windows. And you're listening to your rotting, rotting time machine that you keep putting creams on and doing all this thing to making your time machine stop rotting in front of your eyes. saying, please stop rotting. I can't take you out for a date. I can't do anything. Come on, you're rotting on me. Stop it. But you're going to lose the game with your rotting time machine. This, you make it up to the impersonal, is a transition to a higher floor that positions you to start saying, OK, what's real and what's not? What's truth and what's not? Uh, what are some of my archetypal patterns? Because these tell you what your power struggles are and what you are contracted for. But you're not, you're not going to get 
that, that you simply have to deal with it. And there'll be players in your life. So like Jesus said, it's perfect. Like Jesus said, there's nothing you can do about this. I'm under contract for this experience. I need a Judas, I need a Herod, I need a couple of idiot disciples, I need a, I need a Pontius Pilate, I need a garden, I need, come on, let's go. I need that cross, I need that. I need this. Finally, he says, forgive them, this is all a setup. I was under contract. And then I'm out of this nightclub. Okay, it's contract. How we, do, and even then, before, he said, I don't want to do this. This is a lousy contract. I got to tell you, I don't want to, I don't want to do this. I don't want to, I don't want to have a thousand million churches named after me. Really keep it, keep it. I don't want to do this. This is, this sucks. And he doesn't hear anything. This is a big deal. He doesn't have an apparition come down and say, now come on, you got to do it. You know, my mother didn't love me. Yes, she did. When my father abandoned me, he was just a lousy carpenter. He said, shut up. <laughs> he doesn't hear anything. And, and you know, the scripture doesn't miss a trick, which means not hearing something is hearing something. Heaven doesn't miss a trick, people. When you say, I, need to, I could use some guidance, I could use a hit of some guidance. I don't hear anything. Yo, it's me. You don't hear anything? That says, I'm not, I don't waste my breath. Everything is as it should be. That is your guidance. That's your guidance. And it, then you say to yourself, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm in a hell of a mess, right? Okay. When you don't get that kind of guidance that you were looking for, it means you have enough guidance. And, and, and we'll get to all that tomorrow, but even Jesus said, you are going to go through, get this away from me. I need some guidance. I want it out of here. And it's not going to happen because what we have to understand is that this transition is oftentimes the death of our lower self is never going to be something we're going to want to do. Never, 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 never. Never. Do you want to do a fun exercise? Be a what? Be a oh, 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 stop. It's fun. I want you to find a couple of people that you haven't yet met, I mean that you don't really yet know well, and partner up with them. So, uh, so this goes without saying, I don't want mothers and daughters, I don't want husbands and wives. I would like people that, husbands and wives, mothers and daughters have got to split up. Split up, split up. All right, archetypes, I'll just redefine it for this, are patterns of power. And all of us, have these impersonal patterns of power and they influence us. They, they exert control in every single thing. They dress you. They organize your haircuts, your social life, your relationships, your who you date, who you don't date, your housekeeping skills. Wow. Yeah, well, Jesus is right, right? They organize everything. You people watch, you actually archetype watch. And you're so good at it that you don't, you, you, there isn't one person that you have not typed in this room. And they you. And this exercise is about you allowing these people to pull at least six of your archetypes out. Huh? <laughs> right off the bat, without you saying anything, and you can't question. Let them just look at you. You're all, you're on the archetype hot seat. <laughs> to show you how you ooze your archetypes. You ooze them. 
You just ooze them. They're all over. They're in your hair. They're in your style. Wait a minute. And, and, and well, 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 don't talk. I am speaking. <laughs> Who's speaking? I am. Okay. Now, what, what do you, do you, this is so much fun. Because what you, what you realize is you are an open book. You're a wide open book. And what you also realize is that you, you, these archetypal patterns are so thick in you and it's impersonal. There's nothing you can do to not make these archetypes. You can't make them go away. You can't make them not be there. There's nothing I can do to not look like a teacher, to not look like an academic, to not, to not, it, it's just, <laughs> but think about yourself. I never ha I don't have the mother archetype. And from the get-go, I knew I would not be a mother. It's not in me. It's not an archetypal pattern that I have. And I knew it. I knew it when I, and I saw all those kids, all the college girls that I went with, and they were planning their marriages, and they absolutely knew that they would marry before or right after college. And I went to an all women's wonderful la di da college. You know, like, and, and I thought, how in the world could they possibly count on, because marriage is something you need another person. I mean, where was this other person going to come from? Like suddenly another person. And it baffled me that they were so confident that they would meet another person. To this day that baffles me. It does not baffle me to speak in front of the UN or to turn the world upside down by myself. That seems so ordinary to me. Ordinary, of course you do that. Ordinary. It's never scared me to lecture in front of thousands of people. I don't blink an eye. I don't even have notes. But the thought of that has me like this. Do you see? I don't have that pattern. Now you, all of you, have patterns. And you know your patterns, and you know the patterns you don't have. You know the ones you don't have. And everyone sitting with you can sense the patterns you do have. Every one of you. So what I'm going to do is, one of you says, all right, I'm in the hot seat, and the other two, or the other three, whatever, you get to say, you have this pattern, you have this pattern, you have this one, you have this. and just say how you sense that, and what you think that pattern is, and how you think it manifests in that person's life. And when that person's done, next one says, I'm in the archetypal hot seat. Got it? Go.